Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, John, and, and thanks to the uh, Berkman Center staff. I also wanted to uh, thank uh, Generals Coakley and Blumenthal and Cooper uh, for their attention to this issue um, <clears throat> and for their, their opening remarks, uh, and, and their staff. Uh, uh, Jay, Tony, Scott, uh, thanks very much uh, for uh, uh, helping uh, uh, with this effort. Uh, and acknowledge uh, uh, one of the uh, social networks out there that, that is, is already using age verification, that being Linden Lab. Uh, and there are others that are voluntarily uh, taking a, uh, uh, an approach to age verification, uh, which uh, enables uh, a, a mitigation of risk it certainly is not a, 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 a all-encompassing solution, but we will take what we can get, um, as uh, uh, the Attorney General said, and uh, uh, there are social networks out there that are actually uh, taking the initiative uh, uh, with respect to age and, age and identity verification. Uh, I, I have just a couple of slides. I'm going to skip over the, the uh, majority of them, but I wanted to just uh, review this with you. Uh, integrity is an already deployed age and identity verification solution. Uh, more than 50 million uh, verifications have been performed uh, by citizens who are uh, providing information then entering certain types of uh, sites, uh, winery sites, for instance, and others, uh, where age needs to be verified. Uh, we provide this uh, technology for a fee to various commercial entities and to some government entities who want to know a little bit more about the people that are coming into the website and we ensure the transaction, meaning we ensure the merchant against prosecution for violation of uh, uh, an age verification requirement, as in the case of tobacco, for instance. There are four scenarios under which age and identity verification can mitigate risk for youngsters at social networks, and I will review them, they fall into two categories. One is to deter kids from acting older than they are, and the second is to deter adult predators from acting younger than they are. In case one, a child registers with the correct age. Case two, they register with bogus details. Three, a predator registers with correct details. And four, a predator impersonates a child and an adult, creates a fictitious child and a fictitious adult. In scenario one, if the child attempts to register age verification, it's pretty straightforward. It's done every day at thousands of sites for global Fortune 1000 companies. Uh, if the uh, access is granted, uh, then and the child has impersonated another real adult who has been verified, a postcard is sent, similar to what I get from Fidelity when I change my password at the Fidelity website or United Airlines. It's very simple. It's very effective. I get one when my daughter is supposed to carry home her report card and I get a postcard in the mail from the school asking me if I received the postcard. This is not high tech, but it works very, very well. It's also not perfect. Under scenario two, the child attempts to register with bogus details. Again, if the, if the, if the details are fabricated, the access can be granted, but the parent, in the case of a tobacco website, for instance, receives a phone call, or again, a postcard saying someone registered with your details at this website, and if it wasn't you, call this 800 number. Under scenario three, the predator tries to register with the correct details. Well, if you're doing a scrub of the convicted sex offender database, you can catch those predators who are doing that. And of course, under scenario four, you're back where a predator has created a fictitious child and a fictitious adult, but if the fictitious, if the predator has impersonated an adult, that adult, again, gets a notification, a phone call, or a postcard at the address on the government-issued ID used for the verification and thereby knows that someone registered in their name. Now, as I say, these solutions are not perfect, but they do serve to mitigate risk. Part of the issue with age verification is that if you accept that, if you, if you want to go to the point of view that age verification cannot work online, then there's a, there are large areas of commerce currently engaged in by these same social networks which would be off limits, tobacco marketing, alcohol marketing and the, lot, and the like. So we are in a scenario now where with many activities age verification is an accepted form of limiting child access to certain types of content or material and extending it to the social networks 
with their advertising, but also with protection of children in mind, is a uh, fairly straightforward process. I'm going to skip through this and get straight to the questions. But I did want to say one thing about the, the uh, overall discussion. Uh, we have laws in, in the real world where if a sexual predator moves into a neighborhood, the neighbors have to be notified. And what we're talking about here is analogous situation in the virtual world, where if someone is a sexual predator and they have set up shop at a social network, those who have been in contact with that sexual predator unknowingly have a right to know that they were contacted by a sexual predator or worse still, that their child had been communicating with a sexual predator. And one of the things that we would like to see this task force unambiguously recommend is that those who were contacted by the 50,000 convicted sex offenders that had infested MySpace, those parents of children who were in communication with those 50,000 convicted sex offenders, they have a right to know. They have a right to know that their children were being communicated with by convicted sex offenders. This information is available. It is contained in the logs of the contacts between MySpace and the logs of the contacts of MySpace between those convicted sex offenders and the minors. And the parents have a right to know this. I will be happy to take any questions at this point uh, about age verification or about the presentation in general. John Phillips, thank you for modeling good behavior with five minutes of, discussion, of, of presentation. And uh, we'll take some questions now from the back, sir. And if you don't mind telling us, that'd be great. Hello? There we go. OK. So uh, my name is Chris Segoyan. I'm, uh, I'm a blogger with the CNET Blogger Network. Um, we saw last week that uh, Vice Presidential Candidate Sarah Palin's uh, email account was hacked because someone went onto Wikipedia and found her date of birth, uh, where she met her husband, and her zip code. What's to stop children from going onto Wikipedia, finding the names, date of birth, and zip codes of other people, and logging in as them onto these systems? Would, this, would the security of your product rely upon Sarah Palin's staff receiving the postcard and calling you up to, to notify you that the information uh, was used fraudulently? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, very good question. So the, the nature of the security, you can make, with identity verification, you can make the security procedures as, as robust or as loose as you wish to make it. And it generally depends on an industry by industry basis. So for instance, if you look at any of the major motion picture studios which show R-rated trailers online, they use generally very loose age verification standards, the type of information, for instance, which you can find online about certain individuals. Now, some of the age verification providers look to block out the use of a, an ID. A Sarah Palin, for instance, would be one that came up a week ago, where Sarah Palin is repeatedly trying to log into an R-rated movie site, for instance, or people impersonating Sarah Palin because the details are being passed around by kids. But in the case of a tobacco website, for instance, the information such as social security number or last four digits of social or a driver's license number, that information is much harder to come by. Again, it depends on the risk profile of the website and how much information you want to pose. There are also the knowledge-based authentication you'll hear from some of the providers today. And where knowledge-based authentication comes in is where you're, you're asking somebody, for instance, information that is not in their wallet but would be known only to them or to their spouse. For instance, where do you hold a mortgage, which bank holds a mortgage on your home, or where did you live two or three years ago? So, but I want to acknowledge that none of these systems are perfect, including the one that protects my 401k. These are all gradations of different levels of security. John, thank you. Um, is anyone on the Technology Advisory Board eager to ask a question based on the submissions? I just want to make sure that the, this group also gets a, a crack in at questions. Please. Uh, no, great, Jess, if you wouldn't mind. And, and uh, sir, I think your hand was up back here. I'll just talk loudly.
Sure, great question. So after this, uh, after tomorrow, I'll be going to Luxembourg with some of the other uh, members of the task force. We're presenting re regarding European social networks that are based in Europe. Uh, there will always be those who are, for instance, trading in, in stolen ID, as uh, Attorney General uh, Coakley referenced. And there will be, it will be more difficult in certain regions of the world to verify using information that's in a database. Uh, but there is information, for instance, in the gambling sector, where there is a tremendous amount of commerce internationally, but not in the United States. Uh, these gaming websites have found means to request enough information to make sure that the person who's registering at the site uh, is going to pay their bill, for instance, or comports with what the credit card company has that they are using to place the transaction. So they're not perfect. And some jurisdictions, like there's certain Eastern European jurisdictions where a lot of fraudulent transactions come through, where they know if they do not get, they have tighter security. So they will require more information about that individual than they would in a place like the UK where the fraud rates are lower. So just as with the type of website, if you're selling tobacco, you will have, under the master settlement, you will have a tougher standard for identity verification, require more information than you will if you are letting somebody in to see an R-rated trailer. It's not to say that people won't try to break in to see an R-rated trailer or a tobacco website, but if you raise the bar high enough with the industry and with the country, you can find that optimal mix. And I would say this, the vast majority of the social network sites, those in Europe and those that are here, uh, are going to, are not going to abandon the U.S. market if regulations are put into place here or if there's a self-regulatory regimen here uh, and in Europe because that's where the advertisers are. It's highly unlikely that Coors and Anheuser-Busch and others are going to follow MySpace to Tasmania so that they don't have to do age verification, not that MySpace would want to go to Tasmania. But the fact of the matter is, if you can set up a self-regulatory, a reasonable, commercially reasonable self-regulatory structure that works in the United States and works in Europe, you have done a great deal to protect children in the United States and Europe, and that's, what, that, that's the goal. Uh, just a short question. I just need a clarification. Um, as part of the cycle, if you will, um, let's say a child is attempting to, to log on um, with false information, maybe borrowed information, whatever. A part of the cycle is this card uh, that is sent to the parent. Is that correct? It can be for certain sites, such as 401ks. That is part of the identity verification cycle. Okay. So uh, what's the normal procedure then? Well, it depends on how it depends on the type of site. Whether they want to have, uh, in in the case of tobacco, for instance, in California, uh, you must uh, make a phone call to the residents after 5 p.m. Uh, if you want to ship tobacco into the state. Uh, but it, it varies. Virginia's got a different rule, and other states have different rules, and it depends on the industry and depends on the degree of security. You know, if if the position is that certain social network sites will not adopt age verification and mitigate risk and disclose communications with children to the parents of those children, then I would suggest that if the lawmakers get involved, the standards that are imposed are going to be much more draconian, as happened in California with respect to tobacco. Uh, so, you know, this is really the time to come forward with a voluntary regimen to uh, find a re commercially reasonable steps. They don't have to be perfect but commercially reasonable steps that help to mitigate risk and help to keep parents informed. John, let me just ask something you noted in your written submission, um, that, that the system after a child has been verified, um, there, there's really nothing that you're providing that would prevent um, that user ID from being traded around or given to other people. Is, is, that, is that right? That's correct. I wanted to, uh, and, and thank you, John, the, the, the system is not perfect in this regard. So I'll give you an example of how we address that particular issue. It's not perfect, but how we address the particular issue of shared credentials. This happens a lot with the R-rated movies, where one kid gets online using his, again, with a low security bar, using his, some types of credentials that they needed to get online to watch, um, uh, you know, forgetting Sarah Marshall the R-rated trailer for that. Now, what happens is once that kid gets in, he or she will provide those same credentials to their circle of buddies. Maybe they go on MySpace to do it. Uh, maybe they just email their friends or pass it at the playroom in the playground at, at school. We look for those credentials being used more than once coming from a different location. So when we, so when we see five Sarah Palins coming in, 
to see Forgetting Sarah Marshall R-rated trailer, we shut down those credentials. Again, you've let four kids in to see the Forgetting Sarah Marshall trailer, but you've stopped that same credential from being used again and again. The kids are very creative and they're going to find ways to sneak into various types of sites. But the number of kids that are going to take their parents' social security number, driver's license number, and other types of information in order to uh, uh, pose a scenario such as the ones I, I, I mentioned are, are very rare. So we, it's not a perfect solution, John, as you say. There are ways for uh, credentials to be shared. Uh, but uh, we do have a way to, to, to put a stop to that at a certain point. You can shut it down after two, you can shut it down after ten, you can shut it down after just one instance of a credential being used. We've got one last question uh, here, please. <clears throat> Hi, John. Uh, Bart LeClellan, Institute for Policy Innovation. And a task force member as well. Thank you, sir. Uh, in, in the best thinking of uh, doing a properly prepared appellate brief, what's the best argument against your technology? as compared to the marketing landscape? Or, phrase a different way, what is your biggest challenge in the market when you're selling now? In other words, social networking sites, it would seem to me there's been a great case laid out that most of them would probably want to provide as much protection for their customers as possible. Why don't they all have your technology? Okay, so I can answer the way it's framed the second way you, you put it, and it's, a, it's an excellent question. Okay, so, so the, you know, the age and the identity verification market is gonna grow and grow and grow. Companies need to know who they're doing business with, and they want generally to do the responsible thing. They do not want to have to go to Tasmania in order to set up a social networking site, and principally that's because the advertisers are here. The advertisers want to reach people that they want to be able to target with specific advertising based on whether they can buy their products. Alcohol is an example of that. The difficulty that we have is that some social networks think that imposing any type of age verification is going to be a death blow to the social network itself. They, they, presumably they've got a different model in mind, which is that complete anonymity uh, is, uh, you know, is, a, is a business model that can, that can thrive, and maybe, maybe it can. Uh, we would like to see social networks have a minimum floor of self-regulatory behavior, the way the movie studios do, the, the, the wineries, the tobacco companies and the like. In the case of the tobacco companies, it's the law. So I would say that the market itself is developing and it's going to be growing quite rapidly. If this task force were to conclude, incredible as it seems to me, that age verification does not mitigate risk for social networking sites, that would be a problem for the age verification companies. Because what that does is provide a green light to companies who also in other sectors, as well as in this sector, who want to do the right thing but have competitors who are doing nothing to mitigate the risk to children. So I would say that uh, we're not looking for a government mandated solution, but the recommendations of this task force with respect to adopting age and identity, reasonable age and identity verification to mitigate risk to children, and most importantly, notifying the parents of kids who've been contacted by predators online. I think those are reasonable steps this task force can take in order to move the ball forward and avoid a regulatory, uh, the passage of laws which may be draconian and may not benefit anybody in the industry. John thank Phillips, you very much. Thank you very much. As ideology sets up, uh, there was one question that I uh, was asked and wanted just to address, uh, address directly, which is, of the 41 submissions, how were the 15 or so who are presenting today selected? Um, and I wanted to just give a sense of that process um, as ideology sets up. Um, we did two things. One was those who were uh, um, uh, invited to be members of the task force by the attorneys general in MySpace at the outset um, were given a chance to present. Um, and uh, in addition to that, those who were um, uh, identified by the Technology Advisory Board um, to the task force, um, I accepted those recommendations. So that is how the, the group of 15 were set up. Um, ideology, please. Hi, I'm Jody Florence. I'm with Ideology. And um, I wanted to tell you my approach or our approach at Ideology, and it, it goes back to what um, Attorney General Blumenthal was talking about this morning was that there is no one perfect solution. It is, there is no magic bullet. Um, what we're trying to do is show how important identity and age verification is and how much it helps enable other technologies Take as care. well. Thank you. So with that in mind, I'll just give you an overview of what ideology is all about. 
and we're an identity and age verification provider. We've been in the market since 2003, and our solutions have been deployed since 2003, and they are commercially reasonable and viable. And the way that it works is we essentially verify the identity and age of consumers not present. And we do this in a safe and secure way. And what I mean is that we're very focused on consumer privacy and making sure that we're keeping data out of the hands of the enterprises and protecting the consumers and the businesses from overexposure of data. And how this could be worked in a social networking situation is that it helps the social networks to create a walled garden, so to speak, so that they are not compromising consumer privacy. They're allowing adult choice. And essentially, a lot of the ver uh, social networks today have unverified walled gardens, where they're trying to segment certain things for people under 18, people over 18. So this helps to make those walled gardens for the adults actual verified communities. So ideology solutions are used um, in multiple industries. Um, it's concerned with protecting minors on the internet. This includes social networks. John spoke a bit of, of those. We also have some social networks that are, have actively deployed age verification and are voluntarily adopting it. Those include IMVU and Zoe's Room. Zoe's Room is a perfect example of parental consent. They're verifying the adult, and then the adult is granting access to the children. They're not doing relying just on age verification. They're combining it with other technologies, such as reaching out to the parents to verify that this was an actual child and that they are related, and allowing them to grant access to the site. Other clients include Tiger Direct, um, Kendall Jackson, and basically anywhere that a, an identity needs to be verified before making a transaction or completing a transaction on the internet. So how does it work? It works um, for 18 and over. One of the concerns we keep hearing is that it doesn't verify kids, and that's true, because the data around kids is protected. But it can work to verify the adults 18 and over, and it does it through a quick and safe process. We take the information from the consumer, we base it on as little information as name and address only, and we access public data records. And what that means is we go and dip into the public data, we verify the attributes of the identity. We're not aggregating data. We're not, we're not keeping data. So we're okay. residing as a firewall, essentially, between the enterprise and the consumers. And then we perform analytics to make sure that the attributes are matching up and to pinpoint any suspicious behavior. And then we escalate to a higher level of verification, KBA, or knowledge-based authentication, which I'll talk about in just a second, if that is needed. And then essentially we return a result. And this isn't sharing this person is of this age. We're just simply sharing this person is of age, or this person is underage, or this person is verified. So knowledge-based authentication, this is a higher level of verification. And just like in IT security, we try and take a, a layered approach to identity. So as John was saying, some enterprises want the minimal amount of identity and age verification. Some people require a higher level of verification, and they want to make sure that you are who you say you are, and that you're not someone that has stolen someone's credentials or is posing as, an, as a fraudster. And so KBA is used to verify their identity, and it's used through a set of dynamically generated questions. And you're probably thinking, what is my mother's maiden name, or what is the pet, my, name of my favorite pet? But that is a form of knowledge identification, but it is not what we call dynamic identification. We go into a consumer's data file or access this publicly available data that is protected, and we fall under the, the rights of um, data protection. And we dynamically generate questions on the fly. So we're asking things like, what is this property? Who do these people do you know? Which of these cars have you owned? And this serves to help the kids from per, uh, impersonating their parents, because many of these questions they're not going to know the answers to. And today, KBA is used for account openings, opening up new accounts, password resets. Uh, to your, your question earlier, had um, Yahoo been issuing a knowledge-based authentication, they probably, the hacker would not have been able to get into Palin's account. Access to medical records, wire transfers, high value transactions, and anywhere that we need to make sure that someone is who they say they are. And most importantly, knowledge-based authentication can be used with future technologies. I think later this afternoon we're going to hear from Microsoft about information cards. And at the last meeting, which I believe was public, um, John Dansu gave a presentation of how information cards can be used to establish a trusted identity.
<laughs> Questions, Anne. And I, when I say Anne, I wish you would also say who you are and that you're on the task force. I apologize. Ann Collier with ConnectSafely.org. Could you tell us how you verify guardianship? We don't. <laughs> Um, the way that Zoe's room is doing that is that they verify the age of the parent or the um, adult leader of the group, and then they do other measures and, and means to make sure that that person has um, access or authority over the child. I like these concise answers. Very good. Uh, Jeff Schmidt was trying to get in the last one, and I cut him off. So, Thank you. Um, comment and then a question. Uh, comment on, uh, on the point that was just raised. When we're talking about age verification, it's very different to assert childhood versus asserting adulthood. And I think that in this forum, we find ourselves confused quite a bit between the two. Asserting adulthood for the purpose of purchasing an age-restricted item is a very different scientific question and a different problem than asserting childhood, which is almost impossible because you don't even know the child exists. So I just encourage us to be very clear when we talk about a history of um, asserting adulthood is not the same as a history of asserting childhood. Okay, the question, to the question. I mean, I'm sorry. The, the question is, um, as a new parent, um, I, I'm looking at this a little bit differently now, and, and why would I trust you or any commercial company with um, a bunch of information about my kids? You're not trusting information about your kids to us. We are actually accessing data that's publicly available. So this, these types of transactions are being run every day, hundreds of thousands of times in uh, your everyday life. When you access your bank, when you're opening up a new account, um, when you go to ac uh, make, sign up for some telecommunication services, you're being age verified. And, and there's different levels. The KBA is an interaction between the consumer and the, and the service or the enterprise that's issuing the authentication or trying to find out who you are. But then the lower level is, is basically under, cover, under the covers. And it's happening when you're not even aware as a consumer practically. Jeff, thank you. I'm going to, um, John Morris would like a question, but if anyone other than John Morris would like a question, I'm going to give it to him first and then to you next, just so we make sure we keep it going. Oh, my, uh, my name is John Cardillo. Uh, I'm also a member of the task force. I have to, I want to make one clarification, then a question. Uh, with regards to adult data, you're correct. That's in publicly accessible databases, but Jeff Schmidt is 100% right. When you run an adult and that adult asserts a child, we don't know whether or not the child is real, but assuming they are, this private site is banking very valuable information of a kid. So my question is, what methods are in place to safeguard that valuable PII that is former law enforcement? I'm quite concerned about identity theft, well, more that, than predation. That would fall to the social network. The, the, the age verification, identity verification providers are not capturing the information and managing who's accessing the social networks or any of the sites. That would be held to each business to, to follow you know, privacy protection laws and consumer data and protect their own data, and just as they would with the data breach. Okay. Thanks, John. All right, John Morris, and then at least one more. Um, you, your, your, your submission f focuses on creating wall gardens. So I, the Zoe's room is a wall garden for minors. Um, IMVU has wall gardens for adults. But um, w what value does the service have for social networks that quite consciously allow adults and minors to interact? In other words, they don't want to separate, they don't want to build a wall between adults and minors. I mean, what, 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 what does your service do in that situation? Well, for one, you, if you're going to be verifying an adult, so you could set up a token, and people that are interacting on the site would know if someone is of ID and age verified. So you could have a, a better trust established with who you're interacting with. And another way, it would also help to determine which of the levels of activities we should moderate more. So if there's unverified members chatting and it turns into a risky situation, you might want to watch that a little bit more than you would... Uh, among verified adults. I'm going to subject you to three more questions, if that's okay. Over here, Benedita, then back to Bart. Hi, Kelly Maloney with Red Star HS. Um, first, I want to say that there is a way to verify the age of children. Um, so, there, you know, there, everyone's saying that um, you verify the age of adults, and that's great, but there is a way to do it with children, so um, just put that out there. Also, I just, I wondered, so how do you prevent, say, an uncle from getting... Or, or, you know, a, a brother of someone from getting the information that you're asking for um, and creating a fictitious child or something like that. Do you know, do you know what I mean? 
I think your question is, how do you keep an adult from creating, uh, setting up an, a child's account that they don't have a ch access to that child? Or, right. Or, well, if you have someone who has the information, has the inf information of another adult and can create a fictitious child using that information, so it can't be tracked back to him, but he has credentials. Well, that would be where we would say that I would... I would say that the social network would deploy a KBA solution because they want to verify that the person putting in those, in those credentials is actually who they say they are and has not just stolen my brother or my sister's information and put it in to set up a, an account. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Quick question. You mentioned very quickly that uh, you don't think that kids can impersonate their parents given the, the question set. Mm -hmm. But if I understand correctly, the question set you ask are similar to the ones that some of the cell phone companies have asked, like which mortgage company do you have and what cars do you own and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Do you have any data that supports the fact that kids can't impersonate their parents? Because I don't know that that was the threat model when those questions were Well, I devised. don't have data that supports that kids can't do that, but I will say that, you know, uh, Companies today are, ver are relying on this technology to prevent identity theft and prevent being victims of fraud, and it is working effectively. They're using it in the context of anybody impersonating anybody. So medical records would be a great example. Um, you know, access before your medical records, you need to make sure that you really are you before you can access the medical records. Bart, then Stephen, then we will move on uh, to the next presenter. Great, Bart McClellan again uh, in the back of the room. Uh, I'm going to keep running at this question for all the presenters to, to the extent I get a question. So it would be easy if uh, people answered in the presentation. Something similar, ask Aristotle. Um, but I'm going to add a little wrinkle to it. So uh, what's been the biggest marketplace challenge for your product? But secondly, you've now mentioned an externality, which is a negative externality for the social networking sites. Once this information is collected, they now have to um, protect the information that's collected and supposedly and presumably bear the liability and risk if they get hacked. So can you give me a better picture of the real cost of your product? Um, I will not talk about cost, I'm sorry, but I will say that it is, you know, I, I don't mean actual dollar value, I mean real cost, because you mentioned a cost that wasn't laid on the table, so I mean cost in an economic fashion. Well, I would, I would argue that social networks are already collecting data on us, whether you're choosing to give them real data or not, so they're protecting your data anyway, and they should have, you know, uh, uh, technologies in place to prevent data breaches or prevent someone from accessing their systems, just as any business would do today with all the uh, influx of data breaches and, and security leaks, et cetera. So I believe that, you know, that's something that's already being addressed by social networks, or I would, I would hope that it's already being addressed by social networks. Um, you know, the, the, real, the real issue here is that it goes back to cost. Um, social networks do believe that this might be a, a, a high cost of uh, doing business. And, and and that's kind of the white elephant in the ring. <laughs> Jody, I'm sorry that I lied when I said three more questions, but Stephen Balcom of the task force has not yet spoken, so I can give him one more and maybe okay. Sentinel can come up while he's asking it. Thank, thank you, John. Um, it was just uh, asserted a moment ago that um, uh, age verification of children is possible. I know in, in uh, Germany and South Korea, they have a national ID number, and that's how they do it. Um, my understanding, it's a point of clarification, that birth records are not public. Is that correct? So therefore, my question, I suppose it's directed to the woman from Red Star, how? How is it that children can be verified if we don't have public records that state a child was born on a certain date, and we don't have and don't accept in this country national ID numbers? From whom would you like an answer, Stephen? Anyone in the room. All right, I'm going to let Red Star do it since I, I promised ideology they were off the hook. So. Sorry. Thank you. Right. Um, well, actually, that's exactly what my solution is. Um, if you collaborate with schools who give kids a, um, a user ID and a password, you can get them to um, go into a vetted IP address or some other source that's already secure, and they can create a second username password entering their date of birth that's coded and then um, they get onto the social networking site from any location. So that's a double secure entry model that you, you know who's getting onto the social networking site is within a certain age range. It, does that, is that clear, the way I said it? it, so, it it's clear, it's, it's questionable whether that's okay. desirable. That's all right. Well, oh, just one but, other thing. It, one it, per customer, I'm it so follows, sorry. It falls under all FERPA Please. laws. Thank you very much, Ideology. Thanks so much, I appreciate it. I'm sorry in advance to be harsh, but I have to be or we will not make it to the end of the day. 
Um, another task force member, John Cardillo of Sentinel, we've already heard from. Sentinel also, um, as you'll note from your packets, submitted three separate technical entries. They have been evaluated separately, but we've unfortunately given them the same amount of time. So um, John has a, a particularly hard task, uh, but go to it, please. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm John Cardillo with Sentinel. I just want to say thanks very much to John and the Berkman Center, to uh, General Blumenthal, General Coakley, General Cooper, as only staff is here, and the 46 other AGs, uh, as well as MySpace for organizing this. Uh, I want to preface it by saying we are actually withdrawing from consideration the kids' email registry. After further review and analysis, we just, and, and the tabs uh, uh, suggestions, which we appreciated and they were incredibly valuable, we realized that, that there were just too many flaws in the model where the uh, authentication and verification of all things was concerned. So we're withdrawing that from consideration. Well, note, which of the three in the That was the, that? I believe it's called the kids' email registry. What we're going to show you is Sa Sentinel kids Safe. Kids Safe, right? Kids okay. Safe, exactly. Thank you. Sorry about that. But the other two stand. The other two stand. Thanks. Safe and adapt, and I've got six slides in total, and we can get through them in a matter of minutes, and uh, I will answer Bartlett's question first, I promise. So uh, without any further intro, Sentinel Safe, many of you may know what the product is. Others may not know what the product is. We deployed Sentinel Safe. Uh, we announced it in late 2006 with the inaugural partner MySpace, deployed in 2007, and it was uh, uh, really the first comprehensive, searchable national database of registered offenders. And we built the product after reviewing other solutions and realizing that the authentication and uh, uh, verification methods for me as former law enforcement simply weren't up to the task of what I would consider a security tool. And I put a, a much higher bar and, and a much uh, stronger burden on companies that jump into the security space. I, I think the AGs would agree with me in that when you put the onus upon yourself to protect anyone, you, you definitely have to live up to a higher standard. And when we looked at the authentication and verification models, we couldn't find a feasible, defensible solution for them to be considered security mechanisms. So we informally polled end users, and what we found was that, and it scared us to an extent, end users, when they heard the word verification, assumed for the most part that a full background check and vetting was being done. And uh, now I wish I had spent the money to do it as a scientific poll, because it was interesting, but we realized off the bat that the false sense of security that that would have uh, uh, promoted would have been, uh, it would have done far more damage than looking at alternative solutions. So what we realized was, let's not look for needles and stacks of needles inside haystacks. Let's start with bad guys we could identify. The uh, topic du jour, and, and, and uh, it's been for a while, was the registered convicted sex offender. We have loads of data on these individuals. They've been arrested. They've been booked. They've been uh, put through a correction system. They've probably been fingerprinted. I'm going back to my experience nine times, state, local, and federal cards, probably three times through the process. So we know who these guys are, and, and there are no issues of authentication and verification with them. We know fully well who they are. We have photos of them. And what I'll show you is, is a little bit about the service. What you're seeing now is actually the, the back-end uh, uh, interface that the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children utilizes. For those that don't know, we donate Sentinel Safe to NCMEC, and we make it available to law enforcement free of charge via NCMEC. All they need to do is request NCMEC. Uh, this is the uh, standard interface. You can search on about 123 points of identification. We add new ones all the time. Uh, uh, it's something that interesting that's that's come up and we're quite happy about it is states, uh, state law enforcement, local law enforcement are now contacting us saying, hey, we have these additional data fields. What do you need? Can we send it to you? Absolutely. We take it. We uh, hired a director of data and analytics to do just that, to liaise with law enforcement and large aggregators to build the most robust solution as possible. We keep it as simple as possible. Uh, we have basic dossiers on the offender uh, with things like scars, marks, tattoos that you can see at the bottom of the uh, first dossier. Um, we have photographs which make it highly effective when our clients have an internal security team. They can do a human uh, analysis. We can reconcile photo to photo. We know we've got the right guy. Uh, in the event there's ambiguity with the photo or some other type of anomaly, we have an adjudication mechanism. It's an 800 number, or they can call the Sentinel office. We'll forward that to our 800 number. Calls are logged, recorded. Uh, we deploy two call centers, one out of Seattle, Washington, Tacoma, Washington, and one out of uh, South Dakota. And what the operators there do is they'll then run a much more comprehensive background on the individual and ascertain, well, somebody calls and says, I'm John Smith, but I'm good guy John Smith, not bad guy John Smith. We certainly want to cast, we want to cast a net that's wide enough to be safe, but not too wide as to inconvenience an end user. So if John Cardillo 
bad guy were to come onto my, uh, or one of my client sites and his date of birth was two years off from mine, maybe he lived in New York City and Miami around the times I did, by all means, I hope that I'm stopped when I attempt to uh, register on a network. And I'm going to call the 800 number and the operators are going to ascertain whether or not I'm the good guy or the bad guy. And what we then do is we take uh, as much, as I said, as much info as possible down to the offense, which we like to know the offense because when often, it, well, the interesting thing is, a quick anecdote, if I have 15 seconds, we find more offenders call us and tell us, yeah, I'm an offender. I certainly am. But I'm not evil. I had a, we had a guy send us an email the other day. I'm not an evil guy. I, I should be allowed. And they were on another client of ours. It wasn't my space. And when I looked at him, the guy was, uh, when he was 42 years old, had molested two 10-year-old girls. <laughs> and he, there he is arguing with us that he's not an evil guy. So uh, we, we find the adjudication mechanism works quite well. But there was a, a, always a nagging question. General Blumenthal raised it earlier today, and it's an excellent point. And that is, what do you do when someone uses a fake name? Well, we, we, we weren't comfortable with the identity age verification model for a simple reason. Outside of Sentinel, I have two investments with my brother and my dad, a couple of pieces of property. I know everything about them. I could easily defeat knowledge-based authentication assuming my brother and my dad's identity and uh, my, my mom's identity if I wanted to. Uh, it's a family business. So it's, it's a very simply defeatable system when you know enough. There uh, was a case in Florida, actually, a friend of mine, not a case, kept it quiet. A friend of mine's 17-year-old son, I sit on the board of directors of Make-A-Wish Foundation, high net worth guy, his 17-year-old son, and opened an American Express Platinum card in his dad's name because he knew everything about his dad. The card was sent to the house via FedEx, and he was out charging on South Beach the next weekend. So we looked at best-of-breed technologies, and what we found was a company called 41st Parameter that we partnered with. We developed a solution called Sentinel Adapt, which is advanced detection analysis and predator tracking. And what it does simply is it uh, uh, sucks off JavaScript settings and other identifying info from a computer and creates a 40 character hash in the machine. Now what I won't do is bore you with the details. Essentially it's this. If someone comes in from various email addresses, various IP addresses, let me work this PowerPoint a little better, uh, a multitude of different street addresses using various pedigree information, John Smith, David Smith, John Davis, uh, Steve Davis, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the one constant will be the machine. Now, it does require some work and some light algorithm put onto our client's user interface. But again, when searching for solutions, and we have an open door policy with any vendor, Sentinel will speak to anybody and we will take a meeting with anyone and if they can't afford to come see us because they're a startup, we'll go see them who says they have a solution that might enhance our services. We, we, we love to talk to them. They can get me on my direct line. There's no receptionist to buffer. Uh, we found this company, we really liked what we saw. And we said that while it won't answer all the questions, and to address Bartlett's question quickly, uh, there are going to be inherent flaws. Sophisticated users, as the tab uh, noticed, will be able to deactivate the settings. But right now, in terms of what we're seeing in the marketplace, we were impressed with this. And, and initial testing has rendered it effective. Effective enough for us to put our brand on it and say, yeah, we like this. Is it the be all and end all? No. But is it a good element for us to add to a solution that should be deployed alongside other solutions, probably from other vendors? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, on that note, I'm going to close and uh, would love to take any questions. I'd like to be, I know everybody likes people to be brief and uh, Thank you. Be thank you, John, and thank you also for taking one of the questions during the presentation. As we pass around to Mike, um, just one note on what you said. One com conversation with General Blumenthal earlier was about, you know, one thing we could do with this task force is to identify ways in which multiple technologies could work together. And you've obviously done this within your product. I've heard from several others associated with this process already that they're exploring possible partnerships. You know, just as each person has said so far, there even a single solution isn't going to solve all of the sub-problems here, but it may well be that some combination of these things with further development could be, you know, helpful. And so we'll be looking forward to, you know, how can we make recommendations and of that I, sort. And too. I highly recommend uh, partnerships with the NGOs as well, because we've just garnered incredible right. information right. working with Fosse, working with Nick Mac, So, Thank you. Uh, questions for John? How about the TAB? Ah, yes, sir, in the back. The gentleman from CNET. Hello, again. Um, so I'm interested in this hashing technology. As a computer scientist, I, I know, actually notice an absence of computer scientists in the room. Uh, and I'm wondering, uh, OK, we have, no. Um, uh, there's so, actually a good uh -oh. cluster, the Technology Advisory Board, so, which we've convened some of whom are quite eminent in their field, in fact. So, so I guess what I'm wondering is uh, which prominent computer scientists have examined this technology and, is, and, and lent their name to it as secure and abuse resistant? 
I don't have the answer for you now. What I'm going to do is, if you want to circle up with me after, I will get you in touch with our CTO, who you guys can chat about this stuff for hours and both enjoy that conversation, which <laughs> I won't enjoy. So. That'd be great. Um, absent other hands, I'm going to my friend John Morris of CDT over here. But if there are others, great. One from the uh, next one, we'll go back to the TAB. John. It's on now? It is. Yeah, okay. you just, it, um, it will be on. You just need to speak very directly into it. Um, so, so w with the ADAPT technology, um, if I were to ask my friend Jeff Schiller, a, a certified um, computer technologist uh, or geek or whatever, um, um, to, to, to create a little utility to essentially send different signals um, to, to essentially fool the ADAPT technology, would he be able to do that fairly easily, uh, assuming he's as intelligent as I what, suggest? What the engineers tell me is somebody uh, who is intelligent and, a computer, uh, intelligent and a computer scientist, probably would, which is why I think with every security solution out there, we, Sentinel's mantra is we, we like to talk very little about the products we deploy because we're cognizant of the fact that bad guys are pretty smart. I mean, you know, I, I, I lived on Hudson and Leroy on 9-11-2001. They were able to bring down two buildings in my neighborhood, and I worked in law enforcement, and, you know, as law enforcement, we were reactive. They had already committed the crimes for the most part. You know, as, as law enforcement... People, we're unfortunately reactive more than we're proactive or passive. So uh, the answer is yes, and I, I think the vigilance doesn't just come in, in the engineering of products. The vigilance also comes in the discretion with, with which they're deployed and, and the public relations surrounding them. And, and I'll dare say maybe even a little bit of misinformation as to what they do to confuse the bad guys. Uh, maybe, maybe that's not the politically correct statement, but as an ex-cop, I, I like keeping bad guys on their toes. Great. We're going to have got uh, two members of the TAB and then a member of the observer group of the TAB, and then we'll probably move to Ben Verified from there. Uh, I, I like the idea of creating a signature from the computer, but um, if everybody's computer is like mine, it gets updated pretty regularly, I mean, almost automatically now. And I wonder how stable that signature is as the software and the various utilities that you're hashing from are going to be updated regularly. Is there some thought about how that signature will be stabilized? Yeah, there is. And what, what I, I anticipated these questions, and not being the technologist, but the guy that runs the company, what I've instructed our tech team to do is to uh, publish a quick paper on this, which we'll post to the site. And anyone who needs that information can certainly email me via the, uh, the um, task force, I, I believe the mass mailers we get, and, and we'll direct you guys to the URL for that, which should answer these questions. And by all means, if we don't answer your questions, send them to us, and we'll add them to the document. Great. Jeff Schiller of MIT. Yeah, yeah, I'm Jeff Schiller from MIT, and I'm on the TAB. Uh, I was just going to ask the, the more focused question, which is, so if I turn off JavaScript, or I, 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 what actually happens with your product? Is it just You'll not... disable the product. At that point, you will have defeated the product. Yeah, but I'm saying, is, that, is it reported up to the, to the customer that, that this person has done something that's disabled the product? It would be individual to our client, depending on how deep they wanted to go with a solution. And obviously, that would fall into the pricing model with how deep the integration would be. Thank you. Teresa, tell us who you are, and please go ahead. Hello. Keep trying. Keep talking. Hello, I'm Teresa from Polytech It's, it's a great question. Uh, anything could happen. I would say the likelihood is very low because we don't rely on one single piece of data. I mean, I've often said at other forums I speak at uh, among the same group that we like to look at five to seven, at least five to seven different points of information to uh, make a determination on whether or not we do what's called yellow light somebody. In other words, this is a potential bad guy, right? And that's if it's a common name. If uh, somebody had an, an uncommon name, um, we would, uh, it, we, we would, for the most part, those are what we call red lights. Uh, we look at other criteria, very uncommon name with a, with a specific DOB or zip code or age, and that email address is one element. We probably wouldn't even log the email. We would red light the individual without logging any specific element because we would almost assume if, if five points match and one is an anomaly, we would almost toss out the anomaly. Great. Last question to Philip Helen Baker of AirSign.
Sir, question, Philip. Uh, well, first, let me say, I think everyone would agree, I'm not relying on anything banks are doing these days, but... Uh, the, <laughs> that was a setup right there. Very good. He's, he's, uh, if he sets him up, I'll spit him on all day. Uh, but uh, you're 100% right, and it was something we looked at, and this was a, a tool for the financial services community. And, and as I said earlier, I think what we're looking to do, what Sentinel's looking to do, I don't want to speak for our competitors and colleagues, is aggregate as many good technologies, and if this can solve... 60% of a problem when we can aggregate other technologies to address the remaining 40% and, and, and make no mistake we're, we, we never have illusions that we're addressing 100% of anything. It's just it's not it's not practical It's not feasible realistic or honest But if we can put best-of-breed technologies as they exist today And I often say I wish I was having this conversation in 2058 because mm. I probably have better solutions to deploy to protect kids But uh, but I'm not so today in September still see yeah, September of 2008 uh, this, this is what we find is market ready to be uh, deployed and beta tested. And, and, you know, a year down the road, the market may say, hey, this works but not well enough, or enhancements may come to it. But I agree with you, and it, I would never, would I ever use this as a standalone solution? No, I wouldn't. Great. John, thank you very much. Thanks, John. I really appreciate it. All right, so our last presentation before lunch, and lunch is now a free period, I have the pleasure of announcing to you. Um, and there's, uh, uh, you can see, in fact, the lunch that you're standing between them and over here to the right. Um, so we'll, we'll go for the, the same uh, 15 or 20 minutes or so and then, uh, and then take a break. This has been verified. Uh, for those who um, may have noted, been verified was a uh, slightly late submission, but which we took into uh, consideration uh, all the same. It's had a slightly different level of scrutiny, but um, we're delighted they're here today. Thank you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Josh Levy. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Been Verified. I'd like everybody to think back for a second to the old days of the internet when purchasing something online required you to take out your credit card and enter your information over and over again. Well, along came PayPal and they solved all of that, right? They made it really easy for you to share your credit card information and you only had to enter it once. They also made it simple for you to purchase something on a website or even send money to an individual. But the best thing that PayPal provided was the ability for both you and the website that you were making a payment for to be able to trust all parties within the transaction. Well, today, in the current internet environment, we need the exact same service when it comes to exchanging identity information. And that's what Bin Verified does. I'd like you to meet Janet Jones. Janet Jones is the Chief Marketing Officer at Bin Verified. She's also a former executive at Goldman Sachs. She's a former Harvard, Harvard alumni. And in fact, she has 17 other Harvard alumni that she's connected to. But the problem with Janet Jones is that she doesn't exist. And this problem is the same for Janet Jones as it is for hiring someone online, as it is for dating, and as it is for child, solving child safety. The problem is it's a lack of identity. It's impossible to know where someone went to school, where they work, how old they are, or what their, sec or what their criminal history is if, they don't truly, if we don't truly know who they are. Well, Bin Verified has a solution for that. And first, we'll talk about the five core principles of our technology, and then we'll talk about why we've adopted this approach. First, it's entirely opt-in. It's voluntary. It's user-centric. The individual chooses which information they'd like verified, and then you, as an individual, can choose where, who, when, and why we should share that information. It's portable. Just like PayPal, you only need to go through the verification process once, and then you can share it wherever you want online. And most importantly, and we'll get back to this in a moment, but it incorporates best of breed verification technologies and also data sources. And additionally, it's really easy for any website or community to implement our web service. So why is it opt-in? Why does it have to be voluntary? Well, if it's not, we're going to have a similar process to what happened with the online gambling industry, where network operators will st simply go underground, and it'll be impossible for us to regulate or moderate any of the social networks. However, in order to encourage opt-in, we need to provide incentive to the users. It has to be about them. We need to empower, empower the individual to use their personal information to get a job, find love, 
or access age-restricted sections of a social networks. And as we spoke about, it needs to be portable. It needs to work wherever they go online. No one wants to go through these process over and over and over again. And to talk about best of breed data, the best solutions for finding sexual predators might not be the best solution for finding age verification, and it also might not be the best technology for locating where somebody really went to school. And what's important about that is to go back to the PayPal case study. Not only was PayPal successful because individuals just had to go through the process once, but websites simply had to implement PayPal and program for PayPal once, and then they got access to all of the payment sources that they were accessing. It's the same thing for Bin Verified. The programmers at MySpace do not want to program over and over and over again for every new technology. The great technologies today are not going to be the great technologies tomorrow. So when we look at the future of companies like Bin Verified, <clears throat> probably a bad time to put up the credit industry, but <laughs> when, we look at, when we look at the future of Bin Verified, it represents a lot of what the credit card industry looks like. There's few strong players, which leads to mass adoption and also usability, but it also allows the government to have a hand in regulation and also oversight for the standards of what these companies are doing. So how do we get there? Well, first, the networks need to offer and encourage user-centric opt-in services. Then, they need to provide to us, the businesses, what we're doing right and what we can do better. The government needs to make information more accessible. It's great that sex offender searches are free, but it's highly prohibitive when somebody in the state of New York wants to prove that they're not a criminal online and has to pay $55. We need to educate. First, we need to educate individuals that they can prove who they are online, but additionally, they actually have the right to request that somebody else that they're interacting with, someone who's gonna be a nanny for their child or someone that they're gonna work with, that they can have them verified and they have the right to know who they are. And additionally, we'd like to thank John Palfrey, the Attorney Generals, Jessica Tatlock, and everybody here, because what we're doing here today is the most important part. We need to collaborate. And in the spirit of collaboration, tonight we're hosting a party for everyone here that wants to join us. It's at the Red Line, which is 59 JFK Street. It'll be at 5.30, and it'll provide enough time for everybody to come back for John Palfrey's event at 7 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to your questions. Thanks so much. All right. Do you want to answer uh, Bartlett's question first, since we know that's coming? Sure. Yeah. And <laughs> I, I think it, the, the, who wants the, the question the, after Bartlett? The the, uh, the obvious challenge for us is a is a marketing one. How do we market to MySpace and Facebook um, and encourage them to adopt us? Because adopt our service? Because it's, it's about adoption. Um, the challenge isn't on the technology side because we're simply a simple API hook for all the other websites to tie into all of these services. Um, so we, while we have to vet those technologies, it's really about establishing ourselves as a brand name. Teresa. Is your approach different from the other vendors that we've heard about in terms of uh, the mechanisms that you use to do the age and identity verification? Great, great, great question. And I think the first thing is that we're multi-factor. So while we're not just an age verification tool, we incorporate with that the best that you need to verify who somebody else. We combine credit card verification with age verification, with knowledge-based authentication, and then also combine that with credit report information as well. So you're getting the best of all worlds by using our service. And additionally, we become partners for the exact services that we heard about. Short follow-on? Uh, I just have one follow-up question on that. Uh, can you give a more visual uh, explanation of how it works for someone to sign up and sure. Great, great question, and it's really, it's exactly like PayPal. When you want to make a payment to somebody on a website that accepts PayPal, you click the button, you go over to PayPal's secure site. Uh, for those that are technical, we use the OAuth protocol, uh, which has been vetted. It's used by Google, MySpace as a way of authenticating and sharing personal information. And once you provide the details on the bin verified server, you simply go back and we disclose the information, uh, as, and it's encrypted, and we disclose the information to the website. So it's all done on our servers and exactly similar to the user flows, PayPal. Uh, Larry and Megan. And 
and I think the, the great thing about, about adopting an approach like this is that it allows for, we just found out today that children could be verified. So we can incorporate that. Once we vet that technology, we can incorporate that into the service. It's not tied into one methodology. It's not tied into any methodology. What might be great today might change. Maybe one day we adopt nat, uh, national ideas. It, it has to be flexible to allow for new technologies that do solve that exact solution, that exact problem. All right, I'm going to have Anne do the follow-up and then go to the gentleman just behind you. I, I, should, I should clarify the opt-in is the individual has a choice. It's not, they don't get spied on, but their choice is either to access the social network, or the let's say Club Penguin. The parent then has a choice whether they can opt in so that their child can access Club Penguin or they don't. The, ind the, the social network and the website is also able to opt in or out of this service as well. Um, and they might, each industry, might have a different need depending on what their self-regulations are or what the federal mandates are. Right, and, and I think we have to encourage parents, and we're seeing with the identity theft that's going on, people are taking a lot more ownership of the information that's available out there. Um, and this actually gives them the benefit. They get to take control of their personal information and who, what, when, and why it's shared. One of the things that I heard before is that how do you prevent somebody from just sharing these accounts? Well, if a bin verified account, actually, if we presume that it has value, that it controls where you work and where you went to school, people aren't just going to be distributing those so readily. Three more questions at least, sir. So, 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 right. So the question you're saying is, if a predator enters their real information into Bin Verified, right? Is that the question? So, if we run a sex offender search on them, which we would do, and we would use the best technologies, whether it's Sentinel or some other company that we vet, and then a, it's okay if they have an account that says that they're a sex offender. What's not okay is if Club Penguin doesn't allow somebody who has a sex offender listed on their account into their and access their system. So once they're, listed, once they're listed as a sex offender, they wouldn't be able to access Club Penguin. What if they're not a sex offender? It, then they'd be able to access Club Penguin, right. Now, then it, it comes into, and what happens is it needs to be flexible so that each industry or service can figure out what's best for their members and what the best workflow is for their members. There's no, we've spoken about there's, one, there's no one silver bullet. Well, part of the problem with, being, with there being no one silver bullet is that every social network and service has a different audience that they're servicing. So John they, need Morris, to, they need to handle their own user flows. John Morris and Jeff Schmidt. Uh, hi. I, um, I just want to just make sure I understand your answer to Larry and Anne's questions um, on, on identifying kids or validating kids. Am I right that your company doesn't actually have a system to identify kids, you would be relying on some some other service right. um, so we, that relies, so, so I mean, you don't have a magic way to connect some adult to some kid. Right, right. the way to do it would be to link, and I think the current quasi-accepted standard is to link a child to a parent. 
but, which is but, still but, being but vetted. How, how, how would you link that child? So we would, identi we would verify the identity through uh, our process of, of, of multiple who? factor, credit card verification, uh, age. Uh, of an adult. Okay, of an adult, okay. exactly. We would verify okay. the identity of an adult. And then what happens? And then once we pass that identity to the social network, they can trust who that adult actually really is and then handle how they want to handle linking a parent to a child. Okay, so, so your company doesn't do any of the parent-child linking. A exactly, Fine. exactly. Okay, I it's, just wanted it's to make left, sure I... It's left to the network to decide Fine. the best way I to do it. I just wanted to understand what yep. you Help, did. Helpful Perfect. clarification. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Jeff, then Benedita, then Lunch. So, um, <clears throat> all the solutions that, that we've talked about so far today seem to create somewhere in the hands of some private, you know, for-profit entity, a database full of sensitive information about kids. Now, my parent hat doesn't like that. I'm having trouble kind of coming to grips with that. And it seems like we already have laws on the books like COPPA that um, seem to protect the sensitive information about kids. So I'm, I'm confused. Yeah, as I mentioned, we don't verify children at the moment. And we don't have plans to. Um, we might if federal regulations or, or the business environment changes and, and that we should, or that there's actually data that says that we can't. We, you can't even register for our service if you're not over 18. But, but are, are you asking adults to provide information about their kids? No, we're currently not. Okay. Would anybody else, would anybody else like Benedita's question? Oh, there is a gentleman who wants the question. All right. We've got it. You won't get booed, I promise, by me. Aha. Uh -huh. Why don't you do it into the mic for the record here? Yeah. What we're really saying, and as, as you guys got over there, is that really this is a start. And one of the, one of the benefits of being verified is that there's going to be a ton of education costs involved in this whole identity space. So if we start now with the other kind of verifications and the technology evolves with the bright minds in this room to sort of uh, answer the questions that we have on how do we identify children, you know, the, the, there'll be a start of an infrastructure, and it sort of starts this way, and I just want to clarify that. Thank you very much. Let's thank Ben Verified. Thank you.